Thomas Piketty, it's 18 months since your book, Capital, exploded into the Anglo-Saxon sphere. Um, there were a lot of criticisms. There were a lot of people picking holes in the argument and in the data. Where has the dust settled? Do you think the case you made in that book has survived? Oh, yes. I, you know, first of all, I, I, I think that, you know, the biggest success of the book was to be able to appeal to many people who usually don't read this kind of book. And, you know, over two million copies have been sold in the world, including about one quarter in the English language, which is important, but which reminds us that three quarters of the world reads other languages than English, which is also something to remember. You know, in Asia, you know, the, there are more readers in China, Japan, Korea than in English language or in, in Brazil. Or in so I think what this shows, and to me this is the most important uh, outcome of the book, is that there is a strong demand throughout the world of uh, some form of democratization of economic knowledge. So you have thousands of people all over the world who are not economists and who are tired to hear that this is too complicated for them. And they want to make their own opinion about public debt, about wealth, about income, about wages, about financial issues, because these are not technical issues. And I think this is what the book is offering uh, is, is a lot of historical material so that then people can make their own mind. So I have no problem with disagreement and controversy. You know, that's perfectly logical. There's no way that we can all agree about the way to interpret uh, the historical evidence that we have, which is imperfect evidence. Uh, and so it's perfectly fine that if people disagree. What matters to me is that the, the book has contributed to develop a, a, you know, a discussion, a debate about inequality, and it's putting a lot of historical evidence, empirical data into the debate so that then people can move on and, and be more informed uh, citizen. The most, the most well-known criticism actually came from London. It came from the Financial Times and the economics editor there who pointed out that a lot of the data that you were using had been constructed in some sense. You'd have to fill in holes in the data by constructing series. Do you think you survived that <laughs> criticism or were, were, was there anything in it that you think was valid? I think there was absolutely nothing in it. But, you know, first of all, I would really like to thank the Financial Times for all the free publicity they have given <laughs> to me. You know, they seem to be very confused because they started to criticise the book very strongly. Uh, and then they gave me their best business book of the year award six months later. So they seem, <laughs> they seem to be really confused. You know, what's important to remember from this is that, of course, our ability to measure wealth and wealth inequality is very imperfect. You know, in particular, because there's a lack of financial transparency in the world, a lack of automatic transmission of information about cross-border uh, financial assets. So that Yes, we don't have perfect data. And, you know, we are very clear about this. If you go to the World Wealth and Income database uh, that we put online new countries every day, you know, we are very clear about all the limitations of the data. That being said, you know, I think it's pretty clear if you look at any billionaire rankings in the world, including those published by the Financial Times, that people at the very top of the list have been doing better than the middle class and the bottom, including in this country, in Britain. So it's very weird that a newspaper like the Financial Times, you know, use uh, sometimes data sources like household survey with nobody at the top, which completely underrepresents the top, in spite of the fact that their own billionaire rankings and rich lists show that, you know, people at the top have been doing very well. So, you know, we know too little, but we know enough to be concerned right. about the fact that the middle class and the bottom groups in the population have not been doing very well in the past 10 to 15 years as compared to the very top. But it is interesting, isn't it? Because you mentioned these league tables of billionaires. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, if your case was right, that capital keeps you rich and allows you to kind of govern the world, it's interesting that there's so much change in the billionaire of tables. Course, yeah, and it's interesting that, I mean, Forbes have studied their own, um, their own billionaire league. In eight, 1984, less than half of people were self-made. Now, it's two-thirds are self-made. So people are coming from nowhere into course, the billionaire yeah, status, course. which is basically a contradiction no. of the... Uh, of oh, the not book, at right? all. Mm. Not at all. You know, but it's always been like that. You know, even in the 19th century, you know, if you read Balzac, uh, Père Goriot, you know, you, you take the Père Goriot, you know, he made a fortune in pasta business during the French Revolution. You know, his parents were not rich. So you always have mobility at the top. Of course, of course. It was like this in the 19th century. It will be like this in the 21st century. So look today, you know, many of the billionaires, yeah. if you take the Russian billionaires, 
you know, of course, 25 years ago, they were not rich because there was no private property. Now, the question is, is the speed at which they have become rich, uh, is this uh, socially optimal? Is this the best interest of society? You know, of course, billionaires will always say that their wealth uh, is in the interest of society, including the poor. And sometimes sometime it is right, but sometimes it is not right. So right. we have to put these claims under public scrutiny. You know, people get rich but for all sorts of reasons. People get rich sometimes in uh, privatization, uh, very cheap privatization. This is what happened in Russia, of course. You know, people, Russian billionaires, okay. they did not invent oil fields. But this also happened, you know, if you take Carlos Slim, you know, from Mexico, who's at the top of the list, you know, he did not invent cell phones, but he became the owner of one of the largest, uh, uh, you know, cell phone companies in the right. world through very cheap privatization. So, you know, wealth dynamics, the fact that you have mobility in itself is, doesn't mean that the wealth levels are, uh, are right. You know, I think one uh, more objective way to look at this is to say, well, okay, it's, it's okay to have very rich people, uh, people in the middle, people in the bottom, as long as all these groups with all the mobility between them, are rising more or less at the same speed. You know, because in the long run, right. you know, it's okay to have rich, middle, poor, but everybody must, must rise more or less at the same speed, at, at the growth rate of the, of the total economy. Now, the problem is that this is not what you see in this rich right. list. You know, you have mobility, which is fine, but the average wealth at the very top, taking into account the fact that some people have come down, some people have gone up, the average wealth at the top has been rising three to four times faster than the size right. of I, the world economy, which I think everybody can see, you know, even people who really want to defend private property capitalism, you know, they must understand that by definition, this cannot continue forever. I, I so, had misunderstood your case because I thought your case was stronger than we don't want the rich to pull away from the middle and the bottom. I thought your case was, was that this rich lot they managed to entrench their position because they got the capital and they pull away from everyone else. But the mobility is really important. If there's mobility about who's in that, that well, top league, let, let, then, then, then your case is much less interesting than the book suggested, isn't well, it? Well, it, you know, let, let's take the case of the billionaires, you know, say the Russian billionaires. Yes, you know, they have mobility, but then their, poli their position can be more entrenched in the sense that their ability to right. influence the political process. You know, why is it that there's no progressive taxation at all in Russia? Why is it that there's no inheritance tax in Russia? And maybe some other countries, you know, because of tax competition, will follow this kind of lead. But I, I think part of the explanation is, you know, the influence of uh, right. private money. Into which politics. is what I thought your book was about, which is about the rich it's about entrenching both. their power it's, and it's, keeping look, themselves rich. It's about both because the world is right. changing. You know, you have huge shocks, okay. you have, you know, look, my, my, my book, it's a complicated story. You know, if it was a simple story, uh, it would be 10 pages long. And, and the reason right. why it's so long is because it, it's a much more complicated story Understood. than what some people believe. I mean, I wonder, though, whether the book puts enough emphasis on enterprise. So some of the very wealthy people, they get there because they're crooked or because they know the president very well or because they went to school with him or whatever. Many rich people are very enterprising, aren't they? You look at the of Silicon course. Valley, the generation of wealth that has come mm. out of Silicon Valley and the contribution that that wealth has made to people in the middle, to the very poorest in the world. The, the innovation Silicon Valley is helping the poorest in, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. There is quite a bit of trickle down and I wonder whether your book put enough emphasis on that. Oh, I, you know, I try to, lo uh, to talk a lot in a positive way about entrepreneurship and not only about entrepreneurship today, but entrepreneurship in the past. Again, you know, when I look at uh, uh, Cesar Birotto or Per Gorio, you know, in Balzac, you know, they were entrepreneurs, you know, they invented all sorts of useful things. Now, does this mean that the level of wealth they will be able to accumulate in the end is just right for society? Well, not necessarily. You know, you, you still want to, to know, you know, is uh, wealth at the top growing more or less at the same speed as middle class wealth, bottom wealth? You know, you don't, you don't want complete equality. You know, it's fine to have inequality as long as it's partly useful and partly comes from useful entrepreneurship. But you want uh, the different groups, again, in the long run to grow uh, in line with each other. And for this, uh, you want a tax system uh, that is such that people at the very top, as a fraction of their income and as a fraction of their wealth, pay at least as much as the middle groups, which is not always the case. You know, remember mm. Warren Buffett, you know, told us one day <coughs> that his secretary was paying a higher effective income tax rate than he is paying. 
So you cannot just wait for private philanthropy to, to fix the problem. You know, I think private philanthropy is perfectly fine if it comes in addition to taxation. But if it comes instead of taxation, oh, but you know, it's, it, it can become a pro it's difficult to organize society. But come on, I mean, you know, Mark Zuckerberg gives 95, 99% of his shares <laughs> to, to himself. How do you mean to himself? Well, he keeps the control of the foundation. You know, if you want to give, if you want to call this philanthropic giving, you know, I think it's important that you don't keep control. You know, if you if you keep well, he control, might, he might, he might be well, look, controlling it to give yeah, away. I mean, yeah, that's fair, isn't well, it? Come well, on, that's fair enough. Well, this is the perfect situation. I control it. which charities I give my money to. But yeah, I, but, I don't know, have it, a foundation, it, but I would like to think I make the decision no, rather look, than we, just giving we, it to we someone. We have to be serious about what's public interest and what's private interest. You know, I think in, you know, in many countries, in order to call this philanthropic giving to a public uh, interest uh, charities, then you must lose any control right in the organization. Really? You know, if you are, of course, you know, if you are chairman of the board, if your wife is in the board, if your family is in the board, you know, is this really a disinterested gift? Bill I Gates, think, look, not philanthropy, the Gates Foundation? Well, I think it's trying be, to cure it, polio, malaria. I, I think it would be much more convincing if he give away power. You know, if you keep control right, you know, this is the best situation you can think of as a billionaire. Because, you know, when, when you're a billionaire, you cannot spend it all just on your food or clothes. So you have to do something. Isn't it the best situation that the entire planet, you know, is going to come and ask you, oh, Mr. Zuckerberg, Mr. Bill Gates, would you like to finance this health program, this education program? So I, I can see why for them this is the best possible situation. Now, in terms of organizing an health system, an efficient health system, an efficient education system. The, the, impress, the interesting question is what works? And the interesting question is what has worked historically, you know, in order to increase literacy, to increase life expectancy? Is this by having a health system, you know, an NHS organized by billionaires, or is it by having an health system and an education system organized by some collective, uh, um, uh, you know, government and elections? And, and you know, it's a, it, I think we are being very naive about the idea that, you know, now we don't need taxation, we don't need the government, we just need to wait for billionaires <laughs> to give some of their wealth. So, I, I think, you know, philanthropy is fine. Again, it's very useful as long as it comes in addition to taxation. If it comes instead of taxation, and if you have people, you know, who don't pay tax, like, you know, Facebook basically pays no tax, and, and then you say, well, it's not a problem if I don't pay tax because I will set up my own system, my own education system, and you will see it will work very well. I think this is the end of democracy. Can we just talk about housing? Um, it's terribly important in the UK because most of the wealth in the UK is actually in housing. And one of the surprising things about your book and the kind of the, the idea that wealth inequality has got so much worse is that housing is owned so much more equitably than it used to be owned. Um, I mean, I was looking at the figures. In, in 1918, three quarters of homes were rented. Uh, today, two thirds of homes, uh, or a bit less now, are owned uh, by ordinary people. I just wonder whether you think home ownership has been a great route towards a more egalitarian society in terms of, uh, in terms of wealth distribution. I am in favor of the diffusion of property, and I think diffusion of home ownership can be one important way through which uh, the wealth distribution can, can become a bit more inclusive and more people can have access to property and wealth. That being said, the very large increase in real estate price is creating uh, extreme inequality in access to property, particularly for the young generation. So, you know, if you take the generations that were born in the 1970s, 1980s, or even more those who were born in the 1990s, if you don't have family wealth and if you want to become an owner in, in London or Paris or Madrid or Rome, if you only have your labor luck. income, yeah. you know, that's, uh, this will have to be a very high labor income. And that's a big difference, you know, as compared to the previous generation, you know, the generation of, of my parents, who were born in the 40s or 50s, uh, who were able to access property just by their labor income. So that's a big change, and I think it's important to see that this return of, of family wealth and, and wealth transmission has a lot to do with rising real estate price and should have implication also for the tax system. Probably it means that we want to tax uh, labor income and wages, in particular middle wages and bottom wages, a bit less, and that we want to tax accumulated property, inherited wealth, and already accumulated wealth a bit more. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not always you know, what we are doing. Although, 
including in this country, it's, in, it's interesting to see that there's been some bipartisan uh, support to, to, to uh, tax more property uh, uh, transactions above 1 million or 2 million pounds. But, you know, I think it's not enough to do it at, at the time of transaction. I think it's the entire tax system that deals with uh, uh, property taxation, which should be more progressive. You know, it should help more right. people who are trying to access property at the bottom. They should pay less than what they do. And people who have accumulated a lot of property should pay, should pay more, so as to you know to to, to broaden access to, to housing and property in general. What about? I mean, we had a big government program here of selling, at a discount actually, public housing to the tenants in that housing. So you live in a, a council-owned house, you can buy the house at a discount. Is that good for the wealth redistribution of the kind you want? It depends how it is done, but it, it can be good. No, it can be a way to, to diffuse uh, property, to broaden access to, to wealth, so this can, this can play an important role. I, I think there's a whole range of policies that need to be pursued. Uh, tax policy and redistributive taxation is only one of them, uh, and, and we, have to do, we have to do them all. How serious is wealth inequality, though? When you look at all the problems in the world today, and the one that we're all thinking about, in Paris you're thinking about more than anywhere else, is Islamic State, is terrorism, is the clash of identities, the lost souls who find themselves attracted to these mad and degraded uh, ideologies. Do you, see a, do you see inequality, which is your subject, do you see that as playing any part in these, these broader problems facing the world today? Oh, yes. I, I think, you know, the, the main problem with inequality is that when you cannot uh, address uh, inequality problems and, and, and social, domestic, uh, unemployment problems in, in a peaceful, uh, uh, democratic manner, then there's always a temptation to, to blame others, basically. So you always have politicians, you know, who come and who will start to blame uh, foreign workers. You know, coming from France, you know, this is a, a serious issue and it's not because uh, extreme right uh, did not win uh, any region uh, um, uh, last uh, Sunday uh, election. You know, they, they made uh, 30, 40 percent of the vote in some regions. And, and this is very sad because, of course, what they have to propose uh, uh, will not work. There's already a lot of discrimination against workers uh, with, uh, with Arab or Muslim origins in France. So is it by eating them harder and harder that you're going to solve uh, an employment problem for the other part of the population? Of course not. But you will always have politicians, you know, who try to blame others. So you can blame foreign workers or you can blame uh, Germany, or you can blame Brussels, or you can blame the European Union, or you can blame China. You know, you can always find right. people to blame. So nationalism and, and the rise of, you know, division and politics of hate between groups and between countries is, is the, the worst possible uh, consequence of inequality. And, and this is why I care so much about inequality, because I think there are peaceful ways to address this problem, which are a lot more efficient than these politics of nationalism and, and, and blaming others. It is the same for climate change. You know, if we want to get uh, uh, poor countries and emerging economies uh, to reduce their emission, it's important that rich countries uh, face their historical responsibility. And I am very sad that you know, rich countries, whether France or Britain or the US, you know, did not face their responsibility so far. It's not a question of helping poor countries. It's just a question of trying to pay for some of the damage uh, that we've done. You know, if you, if you look uh, at the world as a whole, you know, on average, we, we emit uh, six ton uh, of, of the equivalent of six ton of carbon emission each year. But uh, the top 1% of world emitters emit as much as the bottom 50% of the world. You know, and, and these are these bottom 50% of the world who are going to suffer from the negative consequences mm -hmm. of the pollution of the top 1%. And, and these people don't want to pay for the damage they've done. So I'm, I'm seeing know, this, the, this is crazy. You can, you can view a lot of things, basically, through the glasses of inequality, which is, which is what you do, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, when we talk about carbon taxation and setting a price for carbon, of course, this is perfectly uh, fine. But, you know, you cannot treat the same way people in the bottom half of the population who emit two tons of carbon per year and yeah. people in the top 1% who emit 100 tons of carbon. Yeah. So at some point, you know, the world is made of very unequal individuals, unequal countries, and, and you have to take this into account if you want to address uh, the world's uh, biggest challenges. I need to ask you about Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell because you're on the little council of economic advisers to John McDonnell. Have you, have you met him? Have you actually sat as a council and 
spoken to him? No, not yet. We've been in touch, but we've not met yet. Right. And um, would you vote for J Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, or, or is that a separate question as to whether you're, a, you're, you're advising them? Well, I don't have voting rights in Britain. Of course, but, I know, you know but would if you? I, if, I, if I had voting rights in Britain, uh, yes, certainly I would vote for them. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the history of the Labour Party in, in, in Britain, you know, of course, has been uh, uh, marked by the, the huge failure of, of Tony Blair, in particular with the Iraq War, which has been a disaster. You know, I would much uh, prefer the, uh, the Labour Party under Blair to care a lot more about uh, social policy, economic policy, trying to build something with the rest of Europe. You know, I think this could have been much more clever than going to war uh, with Bush uh, to Iraq. And I think, you know, th th there's a need of a change. You know, I can see that some people today, you know, they can still uh, uh, not recognize uh, all the mistakes that have been done, you know, including Blair himself, who apparently still uh, is unable to recognize his own uh, uh, faults and mistakes. And I think there was a change was needed in the British Labour Party. That being said, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, this is certainly an ongoing process, and you know, setting a policy a program platform, you know, is not something that can be done in a few months. And, and you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to see the continuation of this process in the coming months and years. What, what advice would you give him on income tax and wealth tax? Would you you put a wealth tax here? Obviously, that's central to your your book. And what sort of income tax rates would you like to go up to? Well, I, I, I think, you know, my main advice regarding wealth tax and property taxation will be to, to start from what exists. You know, the problem is not to create some brand new tax. The, the problem is more to start from the existing council tax in particular, which, as, as you know, is based on, on local property values and to make it more progressive. So I think what's important is to reduce the, the, the council tax and the tax rate for the lower uh, property owners and the lower homes, and this has to be financed by an increase on the higher uh, property value. So there's been some increase actually, including by the Conservative government on transactions for uh, uh, real estate worth more than one million pounds, two million pounds, but this is only at the time of the transaction tax, the stamp duty tax. I think it's important to introduce progressivity also for the annual uh, council tax uh, and to have higher rates for very large property, lower rates for small property. So this is just one issue. It's not very but, radical, but I, think it's I mean, important. a lot of people think that would be sensible to, to change the council tax because right. right. it's, it's, well, it's let's do it. Let's do it. Right. Is that, that's not the end of your of your view, though, is it? Come on, you want you want you, you well, want much higher income tax rates at the top, don't you? Well, you know, I think making a real progressive uh, tax on net uh, uh, housing wealth and more generally net wealth starting from the existing council tax will be a major reform because right now there's no uh, progressivity. You pay, in fact, it's even regressive. The effective tax yeah. rate that you pay on very large properties is less than what you pay when you have a 100,000 pounds property. So, you know, let's try to make it progressive instead of regressive. Let's try to introduce uh, not only uh, um, uh, real estate assets, but also uh, other assets into the tax base. Because, you know, if, if you have a, a, a small uh, house, but very large uh, uh, financial wealth, it's different than if you have a small house and a big mortgage. So this has to be uh, taken into account. Look, making this kind of reform is already, is already a lot. And, and this is something for which you, know, you don't need the UN or the European Union to agree about this. So instead of just blaming the rest of the world for everything we cannot do, which you know, people do a lot on the left and on the right, uh, I think it's important to do the reform we can do at the, at the domestic level uh, here and now. So for instance, in Britain. Let me just ask you one last one. I, I mean, you're obviously quite a committed politician as well as an economist, right? I mean, you have, you have quite a strong political outlook, I think. Um, you know, you have a view about the Iraq war, you have a view about Jeremy Corbyn and about inequality. Do you think that makes it harder as an academic to bring impartiality to the work you do on a, in a book like Capital? Or, or do you think it's right that you bring your values to a book like Capital? You know, I, I am. I view myself as a as a social scientist more than as an economist. So, you know, I do research in uh, history, in economics. I try to collect data. So, most of the time, you know, what I do, you know, I love to answer to your question. But this is not what I do most of the time. What but I do most of the time is just to be in my office and and you know collect <laughs> historical data. But are you objective? Is, should, should we think of you as well, an objective writer, or should you know, we think I of try. you as a as a as a political writer? 
Of course, I try to be as objective as I can. Look, we, we put all the data we have collected online so that people can look at them. Nobody had done that before. You know, we, had, we have collected a, a body of historical data on income and wealth inequality with Tony Atkinson from Britain, Emmanuel Saez from the US, Abhijit Banerjee from India, Facundo Alvaredo from Argentina, from all over the world. We put everything online and we will keep doing so. You know, probably the best uh, uh, impact of the publication of my book was to force more government and more countries to open their fiscal data like Brazil, uh, uh, Chile, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan. You know, we didn't have access to this fiscal data before the book was published and after the book was published it induced these governments because of the pressure of journalists like you uh, to open their data sources because they were being asked, you know, why are you not in the book? And they say, oh, we're going to open our data. And now if you go online to the World Wealth and Income Database website, you will see that we have uh, data for, for Brazil, for Mexico, which we, I didn't have at the time of the book. So this is the objective is to promote transparency. Then, you know, as a social scientist and also as a citizen, I try to push uh, for the interpretation of the historical evidence, uh, which I, to me is the most convincing. I try to put all the arguments on the table, but at the same time, you know, I certainly agree that there are other ways to interpret the evidence. So look, we are not going to turn social sciences into an exact science. There will always be political disagreement, uh, conflict of values, conflict of interpretation. And I, I am perfectly aware of this. And you know, I, don't, I certainly don't ask people who read my book to agree with all of the conclusions. But I think whatever your political persuasion, whether you come from the right, the left, the center, you, know, you will find uh, food for thought in, in, in this book and in this uh, website so that you can make your own opinion. Thomas Piketty, nice to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you.